right now, oh, every Sunday is Deacon Sunday. <laughs> I see you, Kathy Donnett. We don't, we don't have retiree Sunday, where if you're pulling on a 401k, you got to get up here and lead worship and preach, do we? Nope. Only the kiddos. Of course, I have, could not have asked for a better Sunday this year for the youth to lead than on this presentation of the Lord's Sunday. And that's because presentation of the Lord's Sunday is a keen reminder of how important the entire community is for catching a glimpse of Christ. We need our entire community to be able to do this. From our youngest members, like we're experiencing today, to our oldest, like Mary and Joseph experienced in our reading this morning. This is the next to last Sunday in Epiphany. Epiphany is, again, that church season of intentionally learning who Jesus Christ is. And Epiphany is a long season, longer than Advent, and right up there with Lent. And that should really tell us something about the magnificence and mystery that attends to our Lord. Of course, it might also be that Epiphany is such a long season because it's so easy to lose track of who Jesus is. At least that is seemingly what happens to Mary and Joseph. To set the scene for you a little bit, Mary and Joseph have come to Jerusalem for their purification after the birth. Why do they need purified? Well, there's, there's a whole host of issues in the Old Testament around blood and women and women's blood. And, you know, it, it, uh, the details get to sounding uh, a little sexist a lot quick, but suffice it to say that they are there as part of their religious tradition and heritage. They are coming to the temple for the sake of holiness. And that is a sufficient enough reason. They are also required to consecrate their firstborn to the Lord. So clearly, they've got a laundry list of religious obligations to complete on that particular morning when they arrive, right? And you get this. You really do. Remember this past December 24th, where we had to celebrate Advent 4 in the morning? And then two Christmas Eve services later that day? It's, it's just exactly like that for them. That's sort of how they're feeling. They've got a lot of religious stuff to get through. So let's just, you know, burn through these things. To better set the scene for you, I want you to consider what it must have been like uh, for them as first-time parents. They are tired. They are stressed. Joseph keeps swaddling Jesus, but he's not doing it right, and Mary has to get up and correct him. And she's like, no, you make the triangle, and you, you hook the right arm under, and then you fold up the bottom, and then you get the left arm under the... It's not that hard, Joseph. <laughs> and he's like, oh, the kid looked fine. And Mary, speaking to Mary, she's not having a particularly easy go of it herself this week, what with the feeding issues that Jesus is having. And Jesus is just tearing through diapers at this, at this point, too. Oh, man, the, the loads of laundry that they're doing at this point would be, should be considered eco-terrorism, you know? And finally, they got to take a trip from their town to Jerusalem. They have not had good luck as a couple taking, you know, road trips, you might remember. Not a couple that has a lot of happy memories in that regard. And, and beyond that, I have never met parents who are excited about traveling with a baby. It's just not fun. So this is what's going on in Mary and Joseph's life. You have to understand that to really get what's going on in our text this morning. So they finally make it to the temple, and remember, they're just trying to plow through all of these uh, rituals and sacrifices. They think they kind of have Jesus on a, a firm napping schedule now, and they really need the lines to keep moving because they do not want these uh, obligations messing with his napping schedule. And so they're, they're trying to, to go by their turtle doves when all of a sudden an old man steps in front of them and goes, what a baby! And Mary goes, uh-huh, yeah, 
she says, just feebly, you know, remembering that elder respect is really important to, to her holiness, but also not really feeling it right now. Old man goes, can I hold him? She goes, uh, and then he reaches out and he takes the baby. He's, he's holding the baby and he goes, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all your people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And meanwhile, Mary thinks, dismissing your servant? Is this guy going to die holding my baby? I mean, to be fair, this isn't the first old uncle that showed up and picked up Jesus out of Mary's arms. But most of the time, they're just like, whoa, what a big boy, huh? Yeah, good. You know, he's got your cousin Shlomo's forehead. <laughs> Mary's used to old men coming and, you know, bouncing the baby around and agitating him until he starts to get fussy and then, you know, like giving him back and being like, hey, he must be hungry or wet or something. Never. Never have they experienced such a benediction over their child as what Simeon gives. And because this is so new and unique to them, the text tells us the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Amazed. Really? Really? Were they, were they really amazed? I mean, I don't mean to sound incredulous here, but this is Luke's gospel, which gives us the longest treatment of Jesus' birth narrative. It is Luke who tells us not only about Jesus' miraculous birth, but about his cousin John's miraculous birth. Luke stacks miraculous births on top of one another. It's Luke who tells us about Mary's older cousin, much too old to be having a baby, who finds out that she's pregnant. It's Luke who tells us that when Mary goes and visits this cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth reports that her baby leapt in her womb because the presence of that baby's Lord was, was there in Mary's womb. It's Luke who tells us of Zechariah being struck mute until the time of the birth of his child. It's Luke that tells us that Mary finds out she's pregnant, not with, you know, like the little stick in the test, but when the angel Gabriel shows up. And it is Luke that tells us that shepherds show up like 15 minutes after Mary gives birth, which, you know, she really wanted to entertain then, <laughs> proclaiming that they too had seen angels and praising God. All of this has been going on in Joseph and Mary's life and, and Luke's account. So really, they're amazed at what's happening with Simeon? My incredulity, however, is tempered by two things. First, again, remember, these are tired, ragged, first-time parents. They can't remember where they took their sandals off the night before. They've had about five hours sleep over the last four nights. So a lot of things are escaping their minds. Second, and what's probably more significant for each of us, even the parents of Jesus himself are in need of a constant reminder as to who their son truly is. The, magnificent, the magnificence of the Messiah is not a reality easily swallowed. It's not that they don't believe. It's just that it's so magnificent that it's hard to believe. <clears throat> well, they wrestle the kid back from old Simeon, not before Simeon can play act like he stole Jesus' nose and didn't give it back. And they, they continue to travel on to complete their laundry list of chores. But no sooner do they get in line to purchase their two turtle doves than the prophetess Anna shows up before them. Now Anna is 84 years old and has been in the temple praying and fasting since her husband tragically died just seven years into their marriage. We don't know exactly how long that is, but we can reasonably assume that 
Anna was married around 16 years old, common age for women in her day. <coughs> and that she had been married for seven years. So that puts her to 23. So she's been in the temple praying and fasting for the better part of 60 years. So she steps up, wants to hold the baby too. And once again, Mary and Joseph are reminded that they have to respect their elders as Anna reaches out and pulls the Messiah into her embrace. Now, we don't get an exact quotation of what Anna says. And when you don't get an exact quotation of what somebody says in the Bible, you can generally assume it's because they said a lot of stuff that people couldn't remember and record it all. Anna, apparently, uh, is a little talkative. But the, uh, <clears throat> the recurring theme to her message is that this baby in her arms is the redemption of Israel. You got to imagine that Mary was probably blushing a little bit while Anna's holding Jesus and walking over to other young couples, be like, this is the redemption of Israel right here. Mary's looking at the other mothers with eyes that says, I'm sure your baby's special too. Really, I didn't put her up to this. I'm so sorry. Other mothers looking back with eyes are like, mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Redemption of Israel looks like he needs his diaper changed. I really, really love this story uh, that we tell every presentation of the Lord's Sunday. I love it because it shows that every member of the community has a role in helping every other member catch a glimpse of Christ. And as much as this was true 2,000 years ago, so it's true today. One of the great virtues of the church is precisely that it is intergenerational. In fact, I think the church might be one of the last institutions left in America that is intergenerational. We segregate by age in our society quite frequently. It starts off out of necessity. We segregate children into places of education for their own good, but what that does is it surrounds them with people who are primarily their peers with only a few adults there to teach and supervise. And then it continues into the college years, right, where we send off our youth to live basically in a commune full of a bunch of other people that live and look and behave and typically believe exactly what they believe. There's not so much diversity there. But even after that, we keep self-segregating, and it's probably because we've gotten good at it at this point. Young couples look for homes where? Typically near other young couples, and probably as close to the local school as possible. Meanwhile, older adults are looking to downsize their home because their kids have moved on. They're looking at smaller condos maybe even retirement communities. And so we do this all throughout society, except the church. The church will continue to place 80-year-olds next to 8-year-olds, side by side, each praying to the same God, each singing songs to the same God's glory. This makes the church so very unique. That the church is intergenerational is not an accident, but is the very will of God. God draws his people together regardless of age so that each generation may learn from one another. And while it is often the case that younger generations have much to learn from older generations, it is just as easy the case that younger generations have something to instill and impart and teach to older. I mean, you cannot find a better theological rationale for Youth Sunday than the conviction that even the youngest members have something to offer the oldest members. 
And for this, all we can say is thanks be to God. Thanks be to God because catching a glimpse of Christ is hard work. God is big. God is magnificent. All of us, whether young families or retirees, have our own personal stresses and strains, and each of these strains threatens to, to steal our attention away from God. This is only natural. It's not even necessarily something to, be, uh, to beat yourself up about. So we have to again say thanks be to God for calling all of us together, for giving us one another so that we can have one another point each of us to the Messiah in our midst. Don't forget, even Jesus' very parents lost track of the Messiah who is in their midst. They needed a broader community for that reminder. We don't come to church only to complete our own individual laundry list of spiritual chores. We come here that we might be put into service to one another for one another. This is part of what the church is for. Today, our youth have worked very hard at leading us in worship so that through their work, each of us might see the Lord better. Thanks be to God for the youth. Thanks be to God for making us an intergenerational people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.